Hi, my name's Dan, and in this video, I'm going to take you through the new features in our first feature release for 2024. Before we jump in, there's a few upgrade notices for this release. The first of which is related to security. We have had a security release in the last week and it's advised to update if you allow untrusted users to create, edit and update page content. And then as we'll go through in a bit, there's been some changes to comments. And if you used Markdown syntax previously, then that is no longer available. Although that existing Markdown formatted content will remain, but you may lose some formatting when you now edit within the new editor. And related to that, the regenerate comment content command has now gone away since it's now redundant. And lastly, OpenID Connect authentication has support for Pixie, which if available, you should enable to be required on your auth system. And we'll touch on this a bit later as well. But now onto our first feature for this release, and that is the comment WYSIWYG editor. So in the last release, we added a simple WYSIWYG editor to book chapter and shelf descriptions. And now we're bringing the same editor to comments. So if I click add comment here, we now see this nice little simple WYSIWYG editor interface. But if I edit this comment here, we can see we've got some formatting in here and I can bold, italic and link out, or even I could create lists. So we did allow markdown formatting before, but this was quite a hidden feature. It wasn't really advertised anywhere. And it wasn't really great for our goal of being a platform usable by everyone. So now we bought in that same WYSIWYG editor as we did for descriptions to now make this easier to format content for everyone. So next up is a chapter default page templates. So in our last release, we had a default page template of the book level. So you could set a page template on the book and then any new pages within that book would use the content of that template. And now we brought the same thing to chapters as well. So if I go to this chapter and then edit it, I can go to my default page template and then in here, select a template page. So I'll select this cat profile template, hit save. And now when I create a new page within this chapter, it gets preloaded in with my template in this case for a cat adoption profile. And you may be wondering what happens if you have a template set at the book and chapter level and you create a page within that chapter. In that case, it's gonna to look to the closest parent. So when you create a page, it will use a chapter default template if it's set. But if there's no template there, we'll still look up to the book and use the default template if there's one set at that level. And now we come onto tables within the WYSIWYG editor. Here I've got a page with a fairly simple table, but this is a table that I've imported from Word and it comes with some styles. And in these kind of cases, you can get into a scenario where it's really difficult to remove styles that you might have copied and pasted from Word and you end up fighting it and things feel quite unstable. And then to clear the existing styles that have been copied across, it could be quite difficult to do that. But in this release, we've tried to make these kind of scenarios a bit easier. So now if I click within the table and then go up to the table menu, there's a couple of new options. The first of which is clear table formatting. So if I click that, then it removes all formatting and sizing and just resets it to a plain, simple table. If I undo what I just did, and instead go to the resize to contents, this does something very similar, but just on the sizing. So I click that, it's kept the same formatting that existed, but it's just reset all sizes. And this can be particularly useful because as soon as you start resizing a table in any way, a lot of the sizes on the table within Bookstack become quite fixed, and then you might be fighting that but at any point you can come back and resize the contents just to reset all the tables, which brings it back to where it just adapts to the content that's within that table. And alongside those changes, we've also brought some improvements to when you're doing things by selecting cells. If I select all the cells within this table, for one, this no longer shows scroll bars, which it could do before on certain browsers. And we've made this selection work with various formatting controls just a little bit better. For example, if I go up to the clear formatting, I can select that and it properly clears formatting, whereas that didn't seem to work before. And as a last bonus feature, now when you click within the header row, you'll see a little new menu item pop up on this table toolbar, which allows you to toggle a header row. So if I click that, it slightly changes the style because now this is properly designated as the header row of the table. And then you can also click that again to remove the table header row. Now onto video attachments. So we don't specifically have like video media management in Bookstack like we do for images, but it's quite common for folks to upload video attachments, then try and embed those into the page, which can kind of work. But with any fair size videos, you would quickly come across issues where they wouldn't stream properly and certain functionality wouldn't work like scrubbing the timeline to go forward or backwards in time. This is because attachments were served in a way that requires the browser to download the whole video. But in this 
since release, we've improved on that. So attachments are now served in a way that allows this kind of streaming and partial data support that allows those things like the video timelines to work correctly. Although I should note, if you're using something like S3 storage with Bookstack, then the video currently still has to be completely downloaded to the Bookstack and then Bookstack will serve part of that video back to the browser. But if you're using the standard local storage system for attachments in Bookstack, that should work fine. Then to improve the use case of video attachments within your content, we've had a little bonus feature for this. So if I go to and edit this page and look at my attachments, I've got an MP4 video uploaded. And now if I drag that into the page content, then that gets inserted as a video embed rather than a standard link like it would do for another attachment. And then therefore I can play this and I can scrub the timeline absolutely fine. And now onto a new feature for the hackers. And this is a new event for our logical theme system. And this is an auth pre-register event. And this event fires just before a user self-registers. So this is through the registration form while also triggered by things like the initial login when using auth systems like OpenID Connect or SAML2 or LDAP and also registration events that are for the third-party authentication systems like Google, GitHub and services like that. It's generally any type of user creation that isn't an admin creating a user manually via the interface or the API. So as I said, this runs before, just before registration, but after other validation steps have occurred. And this allows you to have a little custom control over whether a user should be registered because within the Bookstack interface, we provide a few settings around this, like uh, restricting by email domain, but you could find pretty much any custom logic here. For example, you could check the user details against the file, or you could look up to an API and check against an external system. It really allows a lot of flexibility in terms of how users registered. And you're provided the auth system that's currently being used to register and the user data. And in this very simple example here, we're just checking if the user email starts with the text Barry, then if you return exactly false from this function, then the registration action is prevented and the user account will not be created within Bookstack. So with my simple Barry example here, we can see this. If I try and register not Barry, not Barry at example.com and I create my account, then we get user account could not be registered for the provided details. Whereas if I sign up as Barry, then the account is created as we'd expect. And now, as I mentioned in the update advisories, OpenID Connect has had some changes and now it supports Pixie, which provides an extra layer of security in regards to how the credentials are used and transferred between the auth system and Bookstack. And from my testing, most OpenID Connect systems do support Pixie by default and Bookstack enables this by default. So everything just should work automatically as you upgrade without any issues, without you needing to specifically do anything. But some authentication systems do allow you to require Pixie as an additional verification to ensure that it is definitely used. And if your auth system does provide that option, like we can see in Otka here, then it's usually a good idea to enable this just to harden security even further. And lastly, as always, our terrific team of translators have done their work and contributed loads of translation changes to Bookstack. So a massive thanks to all these people that have contributed translation text since the last feature release. So in terms of next steps, the next release is going to be targeted as a significant maintenance release of upgrading the underlying framework for Bookstack. And this will affect the requirements for running Bookstack, specifically for the PHP version. So we're going to go from a minimum of PHP 8.0 to 8.1. So to support that, we'll also be putting effort into updating our installation scripts, as well as providing guidance for those that might have used older installation scripts in the past. And then another area of likely focus is PDF exporting. So currently we have DOM PDF, which is our default PDF renderer. And that works great with just PHP alone, but it does have some limitations. And then we also have WK HTML to PDF, which we provide guidance for using with Bookstack, but it does have some security and technical considerations, while also now being deprecated. It's no longer maintained or worked on, and therefore it's kind of dropping out of operating systems as a, something you can install. So the task will be kind of replacing that element of a more fully featured PDF renderer. And what I'm thinking we'll probably do is provide kind of more like an abstract command line interface for plugging other PDF systems into, and then maybe provide some guidance in the Bookstack documentation about how to enable some different options. So that's everything that I've got to cover for this video. I wish you a smooth upgrade. I hope you enjoy the new features, but other than that, have a wonderful day.